series, and today's webinar is titled Self-Care During Our Current Pandemic. Uh, I'm just going to go through some housekeeping while we um, wait for everyone to participate and start to log on. And I just want to start by acknowledging that we're living in a time of overwhelming stress, uh, video overload, and so I just want to invite you to take a moment to notice your breath, notice yourself in your space. Uh, getting as comfortable as possible, uh, feeling encouraged to get water, tea, food nearby, whatever you need to take care of yourself um, in this moment. Um, as I mentioned, this is uh, the first webinar in our wellness series. So we have another one coming up in two weeks uh, titled Herd Immunity, Exploring Collective Care, where we will um, look at how we can build uh, relationships to build um, resilience and community and to build immunity against uh, fear and stress. And then later in October, we'll have a webinar on supporting staff wellness through healing centered workshops. And so join us for those. And we want to um, thank Anthem for supporting this webinar series. Um, this webinar is being recorded and supporting materials, the uh, recording of the video and the PowerPoint will be emailed to participants after the fact, and uh, it will be linked on our website um, in a few days. And if you uh, want to dial in for audio, the phone number is 415-655-003, and the access code is 667 697-647. Uh, we want to encourage some participation um, through the chat feature today. And so uh, if you uh, want to participate in chat, if you open the chat um, bubble, it's the little blue image. Um, and then ensuring your chat box that in the drop down menu, you've selected everyone and then the chat will go to everyone. The Q&A box um, goes only to panelists. And so just some, work, some guidance around the chat feature. Um, and if you want to send something just to panelists, you can do that in the chat feature also. And so when participating, we ask that you're um, sharing with everyone if that's comfortable. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, myself. I'm Jessica Dyer, the Behavioral um, Health Project Director for California School-Based Health Alliance. Um, and Ahala Khoury is our um, is our speaker today, and so I'll say a little bit more about introducing her in, in a moment. And I also want to give a shout out to my colleague Sierra, who is on as uh, providing some tech support and holding that space for us today. Um, and so we are the California School Based Health Alliance, and our work is based on uh, two concepts that healthcare should be accessible and where kids are, and that schools should have the services needed to ensure that poor health is not a barrier to learning. And you can go to our website to learn more about us. Um, and we um, have a membership, and if you are a member, you get uh, exclusive benefits, such as conference registration, um, tools and resources, and technical assistance. Um, and access to workshops and webinars like today. Uh, we do have our first virtual conference uh, coming up at the beginning of October, and I will post a link to that at the end of the uh, webinar today. Um, with that, I will introduce our presenter. Um, so we have Hala Khoury, and she has Master, she's a somatic experiencing practitioner and yoga teacher. She's been teaching yoga and the movement art for over 25 years and has been doing clinical work and training for 15 years. She's a yoga teacher and somatic counselor interested in using the power of embodied practices to heal trauma in individuals and communities while addressing the impact of social injustice on all of us. She's a co founder of Off the Mat Into the World and lives in Venice, California with her husband and two sons. 
Paula, we want to thank you so much, and I'll pass it off to you. Thank you so much, Jessica. I'm so happy to be here with everybody. Um, so um, before I get started and, well, let me give you a little overview and then we're going to do a little check-in. So today we're going to focus in on talking about both secondar secondary traumatic stress and self-care. I know most of you are getting ready to, to re-enter back into working at the school. Some of you, the schools might have already started. Um, and there's enough um, direct traumatic stress that folks are dealing with these days, um, as well as what might come from working with the kids and the families that you work with. Um, my background, like Jessica said, is around a body-based um, way of addressing trauma and self-regulation. And for the last five or six years, I've been doing a lot of work with direct service providers exactly on this topic. And it's one of my favorite things to do. You all are what I call our society's superheroes, um, going in and working with some of our most vulnerable folks. And taking care of yourselves is really important, but you might not be inclined to do that. Um, and so this is really, really important work for us to do. Our plan for today is for me to take you through a little bit of an overview of what is secondary traumatic stress and also why self-care is gonna be so important uh, for folks like you. Um, a review of, of self-regulation and a physiological um, framework for stress and trauma. And um, I'm gonna give you a, a, a brief overview of a trauma framework I like to work with that can help you maybe understand your own stress response as well as think about the families and the children you're working with. And of course, some really tangible tools to release and manage stress. So I, I do want you to leave here with some really tangible ways that you can take care of yourself. So before I move forward with the information, I'm gonna invite you all to just take a moment to do a check-in with yourself. So find a comfortable position, um, see what you need to do to get comfortable right now. Do you wanna lean back into something or maybe sit up tall? And also think about making sure that your space is conducive to spending an hour taking care of yourself. Um, if you tend to multitask, try to let that go. Try to give yourself the attention that you deserve right now. And I'm going to invite you to either close your eyes or just soften your gaze. And go ahead and check in with yourself. I want you to check in and notice how you're feeling in this moment. And you might start with sensations. What sensations do you feel? Do you feel anything at your heart or your gut or your throat, your neck and shoulders or your back? Do you not feel? Are there parts of your body that are numb? Just notice your sensations. Notice if there's any particular emotion or mood present for you. To the best that you can, try to let go of any judgment about what you're feeling, but rather get curious. Try to sit with yourself how you might sit with somebody you cared about deeply to check in with them, with curiosity, with empathy. What emotions might you be feeling right now or mood? Are there any images that come to you? And as you're checking in with yourself, I want to invite you to get grounded. So feel for the parts of your body touching the floor or your seat. You might even feel for your back against the chair or a wall. Feel for the places in your body that are touching something solid. Notice what your breathing is like. And if it feels good, allow your breath to deepen. So we want to try to stay resourced, and I'm going to unpack this, this, this term later. We want to stay resourced so that we can stay present with whatever is with us. Just notice what you're beginning with today. What you're beginning with might be pleasant, it might be unpleasant. Just notice. And what I would love if you feel moved is if you would share in the chat two or three words two or three words that describe how you're feeling in this moment. Two or three words. And you can chat it publicly to everybody or privately for me if you want to keep, um, stay anonymous. Two or three words that describe how you're feeling in this moment. And let's see how folks are doing right now.
I would like to get a temperature check of where people are at. Grounded, at peace, collected, stressed, discouraged, calm, calm and relaxed, very tense, tired and tension, stressed, stressed, relaxed and calm, worried, unsure, overwhelmed, tired, tired, anxious and worried, calm, need more of this, tense, pressure, calm and relaxed. So just notice how it feels to be hearing how others are feeling and if you chose to share what it was like to share. If you heard others are feeling similar to you, is that helpful to know you're not alone? Frustrated, unsure. Thank you. Yeah, helpful to not feel alone. So this is actually the first tool, taking moments throughout our day to just check in. And even if what you find feels crappy, just acknowledging it can sometimes allow us to suffer a little bit less can allow us to maybe release some of that energy. And sometimes sharing it with others can help us feel better, even if nothing has changed. So we just did our first tool for for self-care. Acknowledge how we feel, check in with how we feel. Maybe share it with somebody else. Okay. Thank you everybody for sharing. And feel free at any point to type in questions or comments. I want this to be as interactive as possible, so I'm not just talking at you. Um, So I will try to be looking at the chat, and Jessica and Sierra will let me know if any questions come up that I missed. So um, y'all are probably um, familiar with this wisdom that we often learn at the airlines, right? You want to put that oxygen mask on yourself first, then on those who depend on you. Um, This can be hard for people that are uh, helpers. Uh, um, Those of us that are drawn to the helping professions often prioritize the well-being of other people before our well-being. So notice if that that kind of is how you are. Um, I know that's how I am. I'm, I'm, I'm way better at taking care of everybody else, making sure my clients, my family, everybody's taken care of. It's a lot harder for me to actually know what I need and how I'm doing. And in fact, a lot of us drawn to the helping professions get regulated by caring for other people. When we feel that we can impact the well-being of other people, it allows us to feel good, which is really, it's beautiful, and it can be a barrier to self-care. And what I find is that when I'm doing these self-care workshops, I can go through all the tools, give you all, you know, all the things you should do. You probably all know what you need to do to practice self-care. But until we really believe that we deserve to take care of ourselves or we have an idea of self-care that we're bought into, we're not going to do all the things. So I'm going to start off by inviting you to be thinking about that. Okay. So thinking about your own self-care and also this idea of the secondary traumatic stress, that if we're not practicing self-care and then we are witnessing the suffering of others, trying to help other people with their self-care, we can experience either vicarious trauma, we take on the, the trauma of other people, it lands in our own bodies and nervous systems. We can experience compassion fatigue where we just stop being able to actually feel for the folks that we're serving. It's just too much and so we kind of we disconnect because we can't handle anymore and it can also lead to burnout so you know i try to motivate the helpers by saying you know we take care of ourselves and we actually are able to tend to the suffering of others more sustainably more effectively um, which is what we need right we need all of you to be doing this important work long term and you know right now with this global pandemic and the world and the state that it's in everybody's stress levels have gone up exponentially and this is unprecedented what we're experiencing so you know you all are dealing with your own stressors and now having to go back and work with families and kids dealing with these stressors and so this self the self-care work is is absolutely vital right now we're not going to be able to 
to care for it for these other families and kids if we're not practicing that self-care. And so I do try to remind people, and I have a slide for it, self-care isn't selfish. It's not selfish. Um, and, and this might seem obvious, but, you know, a lot of us in this work do find it indulgent. I know in my family of origin, I'm from Beirut, Lebanon. We worked hard to get here to the United States. My mom was a very hard worker, and so was my dad. And I remember, like, literally my mom saying to me, I remember one day we saw a woman with, like, really pretty nails, and, like, her hair was done. And my mom looked at me. She said, Hala, she doesn't do dishes. She doesn't work hard. And I was literally taught to look down on people who looked like they were okay, that they weren't struggling. And so in my own life, I've had to work really hard to feel like self-care isn't self-indulgent. And self-care doesn't have to mean getting a mani-pedi, right? The self-care is about preserving ourselves. Um, and again, we're going to unpack that a little bit. But I do want to ask you all to reflect for a moment on what your what your associations with the word self-care is and i'd love for you to just like fire off words into the chat like what's your association with self-care there might be some positive ones there might be some negative ones but it's important that we out them even if you know that they're not true but you kind of have this thought what are some of your associations with self-care that it's me time somebody's saying what else recharge time it's about traveling Self-care equals not working. It's essential. Somebody's saying, I don't have the time. That's a big one. Who has the time? The world is in crisis, right? But it's about loving yourself, going on a walk, going to the spa. It's about self-love and prevention of insanity. Somebody's saying that it's hard to get, that it's a luxury. Somebody else is saying it's, that you've earned it. It's about slowing down, taking time for me. Awesome. So I am seeing that there's a lot of positive, like I deserve this, and then there's some like limiting beliefs around self-care, right? That it's a luxury, that there isn't time for it, right? That it's a privilege. Absolutely. Caring for myself as I would care for others. Yeah. So, you know, examining a little bit of your own beliefs about what self-care is, if you deserve it. And again, not... It, Oftentimes, we might think we do deserve it, but it's not actually how we're behaving, right? I'm going to ask you all another question. Um, how has your self-care been lately? Um, you can just give me a word or two, like, it's been great, it's been terrible, meh. Like, how has your self-care been lately? Zero, non-existent, great, sucks, non-existent, not consistent, blah. <laughs> yeah, rough. Yeah. So with all the great beliefs about self-care, we're not necessarily practicing it, right? And so then what I would say is if you're not practicing it, then we want to examine what the barriers are to it, right? Um, difficult to incorporate. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I'm going to ask you a few questions, um, less since I've returned to work. I'm going to ask you a few questions to kind of dig into some of your beliefs about self-care before we dive into the physiology and the tools because again like I said it can feel like self-care is impossible and sometimes the biggest barrier is our own belief about it and and I say this wanting to offer you a framework for self-care that does not require you to like go to Bali for a month or go to the spa once a week or take you know days off of work we love that form of self-care but I'm going to be offering you a model for nervous building resilience in your nervous system where self-care is about pacing your day and doing things each day that are really small and don't take time. So I am offering you a model that's very, very practical. But first, let's, let's dig in a little deeper into potentially your beliefs about self-care. I'm going to ask you a few questions. If you want to journal, write about them, you can, or just sit and reflect about them, you can. So here's my question. So the first is, what role did you play in your family of origin? What role did you play? You can just think of it as an archetype. Like, I'm the oldest of three. My parents struggled in their marriage. We came from war in Lebanon. I was the mediator, 100%. I was the mediator. I was my parents' therapist. I took care of my young, oh, somebody else said mediator. What role did you play? So you can type this in. So when you were a kid and your family of origin. Mm -hmm. Caregiver, breadwinner. 
peacemaker, taking care of everybody. I was the second mom, scapegoat, protector. So I'm seeing a theme, right? Which again, I'm not surprised. I've been doing this work for a while, the good daughter, right? So oftentimes we were in these roles, right? So we took care of ourselves by actually taking care of everybody around us, right? You know, for me as a kid growing up with a father that struggled with mental health issues and was an alcoholic, I was really good at noticing if he was drunk or sober, what mood he was in. I knew exactly how to be so he wouldn't be mad at me. I knew how to protect my little sister, how to defend my mom, right? So what I will say is this is your gift, right? How you learn to survive in your youth, but it also can be a limitation because if our survival required us to care and attend to others, the idea of self-care might actually be connected to a trauma, to a fear, right? So the next question is, what did you learn about survival? And what did you learn about self-care? Let's see what, what comes for this. What did you learn about survival? And what did you learn about self-care? Some of these might be cultural beliefs. If you want to share in the chat, please go ahead. Everybody else is first. Yep. Make sure everyone has. Survival, you're on your own. Yep, my needs come last. Stay quiet, put yourself last. Yeah, I had to figure things out on my own, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some gender stuff, men don't get stressed, right? Survival equals family. We're a team. Don't upset anybody. So it sounds like from what, from what you're sharing and the folks that are sharing is we can see how that our own conditioning, the role we play, the beliefs we carry can be our first barrier, right? They can be our first barrier. And so what we want to think about um, is what might be a belief about self-care that we can try to cultivate, right? And so even if you don't believe it, I want you to think about a belief about self-care that might motivate you. Something like, I need to be well in order to attend to the well-being of others. I deserve to be healthy and happy just as much as those I serve. Something I think about a lot is I often feel guilty if I feel like I'm doing well because I work with so many folks that might not have access to the resources that I have, might be dealing with way more stress than I'm dealing with. So I often feel like I don't even have the right to be stressed out. Um, and, and I kind of unconsciously feel like I should be suffering just as much as the people that I think about all the time or that I work with who are suffering. And I'm wondering if other people feel that way, right? That, that we feel like we have to be suffering as much as the folks we're working with. Um, yeah, I feel guilty when life is good. I'm getting yeses. I wish I could see you all, but I'm glad to see the emotions through the chat. Um, so this is another barrier that those of us, especially if we're working in vulnerable communities or underserved communities, is how dare I be okay? So many people can't be okay. And for me, what I think about is how dare I not? If I have the ability to be okay, I'm gonna have so much more to give other people. And if I have the ability to be okay, how, how can I use that to make a stand for what I want for everybody? What I want for everybody in the world is that they have access to what they need, they feel safe in their home, they are met with dignity and respect in the world, right? So I want you to think about how might you be able to justify it and actually see that it is vital, that it is vital. Because if our identity relies on us being the victim or the martyr all the time, what actually happens is subconsciously, we don't actually want everybody to get better. Because if everybody got better, we wouldn't get to play the role we're playing. So we, we also kind of become part of the problem. You know, I, thought, I remember thinking about this a lot as I was doing my clinical training to be a psychologist. And I remember having this revelation that like the shadow side of the therapist is that we'd rather be around other people who are suffering so we don't have to feel our own suffering. And then so what happens is that we're kind of subconsciously invested in other people's suffering because then we don't have to feel our feelings. 
So again, this is a lot of deep layers here, but reflect on for you, what might be a belief about self-care that is more motivating for you? And if you want to type into the chat, please do, or just write it down on a piece of paper for yourself. What's a belief about self-care? You might not believe it now, but that you would like to cultivate. You can like put it on a post-it in your bathroom mirror. Um, you could put it on your computer on the corner somewhere. What's a belief about self-care that might inspire you to do all the things we're about to talk about? So feel into it. If you want to type it um, into the chat, please do. Self-care is self-love. It's beautiful. If I feel better, I can help others better. Yep. It's worth the investment. I am worthy. And that's such an important one. How many of us are trying to get our sense of worth by caring for others? We have to also take care of ourselves, right? Self-care helps us focus on what's important. That's a really great one because when we're struggling, we're going to be distracted by that struggle. We're going to have to put more attention into maintaining ourselves because we don't have the energy, right? It's actually efficient to practice self-care. Mm -hmm. Self-care makes the world a better place. Yay! All right. So now that, now that we got here, um, let's talk about building resilience, okay? So resilience um, is defined as, because this is really what it's about. Self-care is about building resilience. It's not about being happy all the time or not having problems, but being able to deal with our problems. Resilience is often defined as the ability to recover from adversity, to bounce back or be transformed by it. I actually like the idea that resilience is about being transformed by adversity because then it's not about trying to go back to something else, but moving forward. Resilience also refers to an inner knowing that we can handle something difficult should it arise. It's also about what we're thinking about the future. And, you know, I know for me that when I'm not feeling resilient, I went through a few years of really struggling with anxiety, and it really sucked. And I took so much energy for me to just manage my own anxiety, and life felt so overwhelming for me. And it was, it was really hard for me to hold space for my clients and my students authentically. I kind of felt like I was performing because inside, I, quite frankly, I was freaking out. <laughs> and trying to help other people was really hard, right? So. Um, Building our own resilience allows us to share that with other people. And the model I want to share with you is a somatic model. It's a body-based model. Um, the more that we are regulated in our own nervous system, the more we can share that with other people. So what do I mean by self-regulation? So self-regulation means that we feel grounded, we feel centered, and we are present in the moment. We are present in the moment. Grounded, centered, and present in the moment. So let's play with that a little bit, feeling and building a little self-regulation together. So grounded. Grounding is about feeling like we're solid. When we're anxious, when we're stressed, we often feel like we're floating or we're fragmented or all over the place. It's the opposite of grounding. Now, grounded doesn't mean we're sitting here chilling like this guy. You can be moving about your day, active, yet still grounded in yourself. So check in right now and notice if that, that word grounding has meaning in your body. For some of you, it will, and some of you, it won't. We all have different temperaments, different physiologies. So first thing I want you to do is feel for the parts of your body touching the ground. It might be your feet on the floor, it might also be your butt in the chair, so the parts of your body making contact with something solid. When you look for it, notice if anything changes in your body. So some of you might notice that when you feel your legs and feet, you spontaneously take a deep breath. Usually about 50% of people will feel that. Don't worry if you're not feeling it. We can also ground through our arms. So I'm gonna invite you to take your hands and squeeze up and down your arms. Squeeze up and down your arms nice and slow. Notice if at any point your body settles or you take a deep breath. That's a sign that your nervous system is downshifting a little bit. 
Notice if something releases or you just feel a little bit more spacious inside. I'm looking for grounding. And if you did feel like, okay, I settled a little bit, I'd love if you would hit the raise hand icon. It's just above the chat on the right. There's a little box with a hand up. How many of you just felt a little settling? It might not mean you feel amazing and everything is better, but that the grounding just settled you a little bit. You can hit the raise hand icon to the, just the top of the word chat to the right. There's a box. And I'm not sure if I'm able to see how many people have raised their hands. So Jessica and Sierra, if you see it, let me know. Um, uh, you don't see it. And it might not be there. You can just hit a, you can put yes in the chat. There's a box that says raise hand. Okay, so I'm getting some yeses. Oh, 10 people have raised hands. About 10, and I'm getting a few more yeses. Oh, it's in the participant section. I think I see things differently than you all see it. Okay. All right. So some of you have felt that. So I want you to take note because these are tools that I'm going to invite you to use throughout your day. Very simple. You can do grounding anytime. Okay. Being centered means that we feel our center of power inside ourselves. It's not in the external world. Um, when our center of our self-esteem or well-being or safety is outside of us, that's very anxiety-provoking, right? And these are very overwhelming times where our sense of safety and stability in many ways are outside of us. And, you know, sometimes it is. And those of us who tend to be caretakers tend to center our sense of self in other people. And that can actually cause us to be more anxious, all right? So centering can be a simple practice of um, physically finding a sense of center in your body. So I want you to take your hand to your solar plexus, which is just above your navel, right underneath your um, breastbone. And just place your hand there with a little bit of pressure. And if you want to close your eyes, you can. And I want you to imagine a flame or a spear, a sense of pulling your sense of center and power into you energetically. You might even imagine just the whole world around you, but your center is in yourself. And I like to say that being centered is not about being self-centered. It's about being centered in ourselves so that we can extend ourselves out to everybody more generously. Being self-regulated is also about being present in the moment, present in the moment. Most of the time, if we track our thoughts, we're in the future or we're in the past, okay? So one more thing to get present physically in the moment, I'm gonna invite you to try this, is I want you to look around the space that you're in and take in the colors and the textures that you see. Don't look at all the stuff you wanna clean up if you're at home or in your office. Just take in colors and textures. And again, notice if there's a settling or you take a deep breath or something releases, even if it's subtle, even if it's subtle. And so this is orienting. This is something I do with folks if they're having a panic attack. This can sometimes get people back in the room, okay? All right, so notice if this one worked for you. And don't worry, if none of these works, I have worked, I have more tools to share with you, okay? So when we are self-regulated, we're grounded, centered, and present in the moment. What's the opposite of that? Well, when we're dysregulated, there's a lack of control over our emotional state and our behavior. We are going to be reactive rather than responsive, and our words and our deeds are going to be impulsive rather than thought out, right? How many of you know this feeling of dysregulation? Yes, right? So I want to talk to you now about the about we're going to do a, little, a brief, brief trauma framework to think about the different ways that, tra that trauma and stress impact us and also impact the families and the youth that you're working with. But this is also for you to reflect on yourself, okay? Um, and so I want to go through like the three categories or um, sources of trauma 
Because sometimes when we have old traumas that are present, right, we haven't dealt with them or released them, and then we pile up the current life stressors on top of that, things become unmanageable. So some of our work is like the day-to-day self-care, right? It's like, I like the metaphor of like cleaning up your house, like pick up the socks, make the bed, right? That's going to keep things tidy. But there might be like dust and mold under the bed. We might need to move the furniture and really get into things. That's the, that's the idea that like old traumas that are unresolved can also be there cluttering your psyche and cluttering your nervous system. So we want to do the day-to-day maintenance, and then there's the longer work of, all right, is there some deeper work that I need to do so that um, the other day-to-day stuff can really have an impact, okay? So the first kind of trauma that I want to mention is called shock trauma. And this is what we typically think about when we think about trauma. These are events that happen to us and they happen too soon and too fast. And they overwhelm our capacity to cope and respond. So the general definition of trauma is that it's anything that overwhelms our capacity to cope and respond. And it leaves us feeling helpless, hopeless, and out of control. Okay, so a shock trauma is an event, a car accident, a natural disaster, violence, witnessing violence, these are big events that happen to us, even medical trauma, childhood surgeries can be traumatic, okay? And I want to say that traumatic events do not necessarily have a negative impact on us. They can traumatize us, which means that we're overwhelmed by them, but some events that are traumatic to one person might not be to somebody else. And that actually when we overcome trauma, it can build our resilience. So this is not meant to be um, pathologizing folks or seeing people or defining them by anything that's negative, okay? Developmental trauma is caused by an ongoing misattunement between a child and the primary caretaker. So this is less these discrete events that happen to us, but rather they are relational. And if we're carrying developmental trauma, we might find that our relationships are strained. We don't know how to set boundaries and ask for what we need. Okay, and that can be a source of stress for us. And then we want to think about systemic and institutionalized trauma which is caused by an unequal access to resources based on race, gender, ability, religion, sexual identity, et cetera. This has to do with bias and discrimination. So if you live in a body that tends to be a target of the world based on how you look or any other aspects of your identity, that is traumatic. That is overwhelming. And it's going to impact your experience in the world and your, the, the amount, the load of stress that you're carrying. And so we want to consider this and I'm really passionate about bringing this in and I'm, you know, this is part of, I know why Jessica brought me in because I know that this is such important work that you all are doing is really considering the context rather than seeing trauma or stress as an individual pathology or an individual problem. And then of course we've got complex trauma, right? Which is caused by repetitive, prolonged, um, cumulative experiences of trauma. So, you know, reflecting in your own life about your, your trauma experiences is going to be part of it. We're not going to go deeply into that. There's no time today. But, you know, for this, the self-care is of being in therapy, doing the work to regulate your nervous system so that you're supported with those events so that you can show up in the world more resilient. I want to pause for a moment here because now I'm gonna go into the tools for regulating the nervous system. But I just wanna to pause to see if there's questions or comments. I know this was a, this is a big one, um, but I'll take a pause to see if there's any questions or comments so far. And notice how you're feeling as I am talking about trauma. It might kick up your nervous system a little bit. All right, we're okay. All right, I'm not seeing any questions. So the somatic model that I'm offering you is one about regulating our nervous system. When we're dealing with unresolved trauma, when we're dealing with toxic stress or a high stress situation or circumstance, our nervous system can get overloaded um, with a lot of energy, right? and we think about it, I, I like this slide here, I think about it sometimes as like the electrical wiring in a building. Um, 
if there's a say there's a there's a volt there's like a electrical storm and all of a sudden there's like a high voltage all this voltage moves through the wires um, what can happen is the system gets overloaded with energy and either there's an explosion or the surge protectors shut everything off right so when our nervous system is regulated um, we're, we're able to move from a sympathetic arousal to parasympathetic settling, right? So the sympathetic nervous system response is when we're mobilized to deal with stress, right? We, we secrete adrenaline and cortisol, our heart rate goes up, our breathing gets shallow, and we get ready to deal with life stressors. Um, some of these stressors might be physical stressors. We're, we're more wired for physical stressors that take us into a fight-flight response, right? Like being chased by a bear or having a physical danger where we either fight the danger or we run away, right? So typically when we're confronted with something stressful, we'd want to deal with it and then we're able to settle back down. The parasympathetic nervous system kicks in and the brain secretes dopamine and serotonin, heart rate goes down and diaphragmatic breathing resumes and we're able to settle. So when our nervous system is regulated, life feels like this. You might deal with something stressful, right? A conflict, a fear, reading a scary headline, right? And then once it passes or you integrate it, you're able to go back to homeostasis, right? So I know when I'm settled, that can happen, right? I can, I can read a headline about coronavirus, feel that anxiety and fear, and then kind of settle and know, okay, I'm doing the best I can, and right now my family is safe, and find a way to integrate that stressor, right? When I'm, when I'm dysregulated, when I'm not in that place of balance, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a headline, and before you know it, my entire family's dead, right? Like, I just can't settle back down. So when we have too much stress energy moving through our nervous system, we have a small window of tolerance, which means we can't tolerate any stressors. Any small stressor can get us into being either activated or shut down. So this is the graph that explains it even more clearly, right? So, so some of us, so when we're having a lot of stress, our regulation is gonna look a little bit more like this, a lot choppier, right? And some of us deal with stress differently than other people. So. I, for example, I'm an on person. If I read a scary headline, my heart rate goes up, I get super anxious, I start to sweep and clean the floor, I start to micromanage my family, I start to imagine terrible things happening, everybody's dead and forget it, right? And I just, I spin out. I notice how many of you are on people. We get stuck on on, okay? Some of you, when you're running too much stress energy, you shut down, you do the opposite. You want to sleep. You can't think about anything. You kind of float out of your body. You might tend more towards depression or lethargy. And sorry, these look a little bit, um, they're a little bit unclear here. Some of you do both. You go on and you go off. I want you to reflect for a moment on if you're an on or an off person or if you're both, if you'd like to type it into the chat, go ahead. And this is important information. This is also important because as an on person, I didn't know about you off people. I just thought you were lazy, right? So, um, so um, <laughs> both, it's so fun, right? Um, a lot of people are both, we've got off, we've got on. So this is also helpful because if you are just on or off, it's important to know that your loved ones or the folks you work with might be different than you, right? So my husband's more of an off person, so when he's stressed, he's just watching Netflix and eating donuts, right? I could never do that if I was stressed. But now I understand that he processes stress differently and we can work together a little bit better, okay? Um, yeah, somebody's saying, I used to be on and now I'm an off person, yeah. So this is important for you to know. So what are the things that signal that you're out of balance? And what do you need to balance it so that you can go back to that smooth state? Go back to that smooth state. So this brings me to the point, and this is really what comes out of the work of somatic experiencing, that in order to release the stress and trauma from our mind and our body, we have to discharge that stress energy, the energy that was mobilized for fight or flight. If we don't release the energy, then we're going to go into that on or off state. So the self-care that I'm really 
advocating here is how do we release discharge stress energy, traumatic stress energy from our nervous system. And now this is going to bring us back full circle to how we started the tools for self regulation. Okay, we started with some of these tools. Okay, so our body is our, our bodies are instruments. Okay, we can't really stress by thinking differently. Yes, we can think differently and that can maybe impact our behavior. We need to rewire our nervous system so that we can release it. So if you do notice throughout your day, your, your heart is racing, your chest is tight, you can do some of these tools to regulate your body again, okay? So the first one, well, the first one is breath. So we hear this all the time, take a few deep breaths, breathe if you're stressed, right? Breath can work sometimes and sometimes breath doesn't work. But I want you to try it right now. I want you to notice what you're breathing. And we're going to do a little breath work together. If you notice that the deep breathing kicks up your anxiety, don't do it. Just be with your breath exactly as it is, okay? So um, go ahead and notice your breathing. And if you'd like, I want you to put your hands on your side ribs here. And as you inhale, imagine breathing into your hands. So the fingers separate away from each other as you inhale, and then they move back in towards each other as you exhale, okay? Come up a little bit more. So we want to do diaphragmatic breathing, not shallow breathing. So inhaling, exhaling. And we're breathing through the nose. And just do this a few times. Don't be too forceful. Diaphragmatic breathing can trigger a parasympathetic rest and digest response. So it's one way to help the nervous system shift down into a parasympathetic response. Okay. Grounding is my favorite because I often find that if I'm not grounded, I can't access my breath. Grounding is as simple as bringing your attention to the parts of your body touching the floor. Some of you might want to stand to feel grounded. You could try that right now. We did a grounding exercise in the beginning, right? We tried to, we squeezed up and down the arms. So grounding is about finding something solid. So squeezing the arms is about offering a little bit of containment in the nervous system in the body. I'm going to invite you now to either stand or from seated, just shift your weight side to side. Feeling the weight shift in your sit bones or standing. Feel the weight shifting in your legs. And just feeling even that this rhythm, I need to add rhythm on there. Rhythm can be a resource to help us regulate ourselves. Notice if this is useful for you, the grounding, and then you could be still. Another tool can be orienting to your space like we did before. So if you liked that one, try it again. Just take in the colors and textures around you. So what we're looking for here, everybody, is just creating a little bit more space in the nervous system so that when we're maxed out, this is something you could do throughout your whole day, right? You just do these little things and it's just, it's like releasing pressure from a balloon that's really full, right? Remember I told you I'm not here to pedal manicures and spa vacations, although I very much advocate them. This is about learning to use our energetic nervous system energy throughout the day in a way that is more sustainable. So this might mean, I remember training folks at, um, at a family clinic here in Venice, and the nurses were talking about going from one patient to the next patient to the next patient, and often they're dealing with high stress situations. And what they built in was literally 30 seconds between patients where they would just stop Breathe, notice what they're feeling. Take a moment to settle before they move to the next one. Those of us who tend to be oriented to the care of others tend to override our body's need to just settle in the moment, okay? So building these in into your day, again, is like that's the lowest hanging fruit, a moment of pause. Anything can be a tool. You can use an image, a smell, an object, right? Sometimes I'll have rose oil, which I love, I'll smell it, or an object that I can see that kind of reminds me to settle. 
You can light a candle. Really, anything that feels supportive, that kind of gives you that pause, is your tool for self-regulation. And the other thing I want to add, I'm going to pause though for a moment to see how this is landing and if, this, if there's questions so far about these, these simple tools. So I'm hoping that you're kind of taking note of which ones of these might work for you that you could just try throughout your day. But this first step to using these tools is actually attuning to your body and your sensation, right? If we're not feeling our sensations, we don't know that we need to take a deep breath. And a lot of us move through our day just dissociated from our bodies, right? And especially if it's really stressful, we don't want to have to feel it. So love the built-in rhythm of taking moments to check in. Yep. Now, the other thing is that these tools, they can help us release and discharge traumatic stress. I mean, here, the other ones are like dancing, singing, running, exercising, right? All those things. But right now I'm talking about things you can do, you know, in the moment of your, of your, of your work day, right? The other thing is that these tools can also give us the support to be able to be with difficult emotions or sensations. Sometimes we don't want to feel our grief or our rage because it feels like we're going to be overwhelmed by them. But if we can first get grounded and then tend to the feeling, it can allow us to move through that feeling rather than avoid it. Um, so we can think about that if we feel triggered, right, but we're not resourced, we're going to be reactive or we're going to be stressed. But if we feel triggered and we're able to resource, we're going to be able to be responsive. So as you think about going back to work, you might be dealing with a, a client or a student who is going through something that triggers you, that's, that's overwhelming to you, right? Um, we can use these tools to stay regulated so that we can attend to that person, attend to the situation with more skill and with more effectiveness, okay? So we use the resource to be able to not be overwhelmed in the moment, okay? But if you spend your day having to manage, right, attend to the suffering of others, just stay grounded and hear these difficult stories, stay grounded and stay present, you have to, at the end of your day, release all that energy that needs to be released. So I made a little list of ways to release and discharge this stress, right? It can be yoga meditation. You know, yoga is an amazing tool. I'm biased. I, I'm a yoga teacher. Um, I am teaching online, by the way, if anybody wants to join me. Um, uh, journaling, writing, getting it out, you know, being in therapy, talking about it, shaking, moving, singing, making sounds, being in nature connecting with friends. You don't have to do this alone, right? Remember how we started by sharing with each other, making art, making music. So discharging and releasing is about expressing ourselves and moving the energy, not just holding it so we can manage it so that we're being re responsible, right? So I want you to feel for the, the difference. When do you actually give yourself a space to let it go? Um, and, and because we can get really good at managing it. The other day I was going on a short run um, and I, I put on my playlist and somehow this like 80s love song playlist came on. And these, these were like songs from my childhood. And I just started to cry while I was running. And I am not a crier. It's very hard to get me to cry. And it was so good for me to just 80s music. I think that's the only thing that gets me to cry, right? And I got to feel my grief about the state of the world and everything that's going on. It's really important that if you're a helper, you find those spaces where you're being held, right? Are you going to therapy? Are you seeing healers? And those spaces to connect and release that energy. So again, these are some easy ways to do that. Um, biking, yes, I was gonna say, can you add, anybody wanna give us ways that you release and discharge stress energy? Because you can maybe give ideas to some of your colleagues here. You can type them into the chat if you like. Yes, I like to bike as well. Jogging, listening to music, going to the beach, walking, comedy. Yes, all about the comedy. In fact, I only get my news from comedians. I just listen to Trevor Noah, <laughs> Saturday Night Live, all the ways I can get my news through comedy. <laughs> Writing, yoga, meditation, singing out loud, singing is the best. Wonderful. Writing snail mail, right? The old-fashioned way. Guitar, making music, right? Drinking enough water, so important. 
so important. And so for the last slide here, I want you to think about for yourself, what are your daily non-negotiables? What are the things you need to make sure happen every day so that your nervous system can meet the, the stress and the energy of your life? You know, and, and some common ones are how much sleep do you need? Food, right? Water, exercise, connection with others, being creative. Yeah. Having some downtime where there's no input and this connects to media hygiene. Do you have alerts off on your phone? You know, I think one of the worst things for most of us is having our alerts on. So we can having a peaceful moment and suddenly we get a headline, we get breaking news. I think that's an epidemic. Um, what else do you need daily to commit to, to allow yourself to be more sustainable? Rest, yeah, solitude, yeah. And I read a great definition of the word solitude is it's freedom from the thoughts of others. So, so it's like you can be alone, but like you're listening to a podcast or you're, um, you know, reading the news, right? So solitude is freedom from the thoughts of others. Yeah. So right now, we have four minutes left. I, I, I probably have to close in a moment. I want you to just think about what are one or two things you want to commit to for your own self-care? What are one or two things you want to commit to? And I want you to type it into the chat because you all can maybe support your support each other. What's one or two things you want to commit to for your own self-care to keep your own nervous system running smoothly? Sun. Yes, yeah, not feeling guilty about self-care. Walking away from my computer. That's such a hard one. Meditation, crafting, getting outside. Yes. Yes, please limit the social media. That's so hard. And then I'll say if there's any questions, um, Jessica, I don't know if there were questions in the Q&A box, but leaving a couple minutes for questions. Disconnecting from work. Cooking. Stop buying things on Amazon. <laughs> These are good. And if you all have any questions before we close. You can type them into the chat or the Q&A box. Am I available to do this for teachers in your district? Sure, yes, I work with teachers all the time. And I've got um, Hala's email here um, for anybody who wants to reach out afterwards. Um, and yes, you will be getting a link to this afterwards. And that is, um, that is a question that has come up. Someone just asked about a short, how to support students in their regulation. Any tips on that? Mm -hmm. Plenty. Um, a lot of these exercises, I actually have a, a two-sheeter of self-regulation exercises teachers can do in the classroom that I'd be happy to send you to share with everybody. That'd be great. Thank so you. with kids, I mean, you could do breathing. You could get up and do rocking movements. You can do shake it out, right? So there's really, all these tools can be done with kids. Um, and in age appropriate ways. Um, so I'm happy to share that with you to give to everybody. Thank you, that would be yeah. really helpful. Mm -hmm. Just another moment for any other questions. Hala, thank you so much, this is so wonderful. Oh my gosh, my pleasure. Somebody's asking, um, would love to share a short grounding or meditation video for students to share. So there's a, there's a great organization called Shanti Generation, and I believe that they have on iTunes videos for kids, Shanti Generation. I, I can type it into the chat. Um, and they do excellent work, and they have a lot of recorded stuff for young people. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and all of this, I mean, and I will say one of the best things you can do for students is model that self-regulation. There's nothing more reassuring than that co-regulation, right? Being near somebody who's just regulated, even without words spoken, can be so healing. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I teach public yoga classes. My website is just my name, halakori.com. So if you want to join in live, I also have a like a membership program where I share short videos. Um, all the information is on my website if you just want tools for yourself, for your own self-regulation. Thank you. Yeah. 
And I'm going to just link if you want to reach out for our conference that's coming up in October. Also, you can um, go to the link there um, if for more uh, presentations like this. And just want to thank everyone for your time and your participation today. And again, Hall, this is so um, timely and helpful. So thank you. I feel more regulated. Just oh, good. Good. Very helpful. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I hope you all found it useful as well. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay. Bye.